Happy Father's Day, uh, dads. Um, there's never been a time where the father's role is more critical to the well-being of our families, of our society, uh, as today. Would you agree with me? Amen. So we want to say to all the dads uh, on behalf of the church that we value your role and uh, we need you. Amen. We need dads today. We need fathers today. We need men of integrity, men of God, men who will love their wives and their children, men who will stick true when the tough happens. And uh, all the wives say, Amen. Amen. <laughs> and so today we want to bless you guys and we want to honor dads. I, I remember when we were preparing for Mother's Day, uh, there's a man from his church, he says, I hate Mother's Day. And we're like, you hate Mother's Day? Like he must have lost his mom or something for him to say something like that. I hate Mother's Day. He says, no, I hate Mother's Day because at my church, when it's Mother's Day, we always talk about how special the mom, and, uh, the mom is and how much things she does and how valuable she is. But when it's Mother's Day, when it's Father's Day, I mean, we always talk about how, how dad needs to improve. That's not fair. And although I believe we could all improve, starting from here on the pulpit here, I'm talking about me, I'm all my kids say, yeah, okay, shh, don't say anything. <laughs> and although I, I believe we could all improve, today we have a gift, I have a gift for dads. My sermon is not about you, it is for you. And all the dads say, Amen. I want to speak to those around you. I want to speak to your sons. I want to speak to your daughters. I want to speak to your wives. I want to speak to everyone in this congregation that has a brother, a dad, a husband, a male figure in your life. I want us to speak to us about that. And here's why I want to talk about that. Because I truly believe that as much as dad needs to improve, as much as husband needs to get better, and we all have room for growth, we can help our dads be better dads. We can help, if you're a wife, we can help our husbands be better husbands. We can help our sons be all that God has intended them to be. We can do that. We can help them do that. Would you say amen to that? We can help them get better. We can help them be better by a few things we can do. And so I'm not talking about fixing your husband. I'm not talking about manipulating somebody to become something that you want them to be. That's called, you know what that's called? That's called witchcraft. I'm not into witchcraft. So we're not talking about forcing people to become something they're not. We're not talking about manipulating them into something or changing them or trying to change them ourselves. I'm talking about doing a few things that will inspire them and help the men that are around our lives be better men, be the men that God wants them to do. If you do a search online, somebody asked me before the service, a great prayer time with the worship team before, and one of them said, what's your sermon today? What's the title? And I'm like, you know what? I forgot the title. I really did. Because normally I always have a title. I forgot what the, I, I, so I don't have a title today. But if I had a title, I would call it Father's Day Gift List. If you do a search online today and look for Father's Day gift idea, hint, hint, um, you'll find all kinds of things you could do for your dad to honor your dad. And so why don't you do that today? Why don't you find something? If you haven't, if you're a last minute kind of person, you know, do something. I'm not talking about buying a smoker and, you know, making some ribs or whatever. But hey, if you want to do that, then go for it and just remember <laughs> us, right? Invite us. To, no, I'm kidding. But today I want to talk about a different kind of list so that you not only bless your dad today, but you'll bless him. What we're going to talk about will bless him forever and for the days to come. And not only will he be blessed, but you will be blessed as well for two reasons. How many of you know that if your dad or your husband improves, everybody wins, right? They say happy wife, happy life, but it's also true with the husband. If your husband gets better, you win. Your kids win. The family wins. Everybody around wins. 
But the second reason why you're, you'll be blessed is there, there's some principle that we're going to talk about that God says he will bless you if you put into practice. That this is a divine principle, a God principle that brings blessing when we put them into practice in our life. And so you ready? Amen. Let's get started. And these are not going to be rocket science. This is going to be simple things that we need to be reminded of. But man, you're going to be happy that you came to church today. And you're going to be even happier if you brought your family with you. In fact, you know, make sure you share this video if they're not listening because I'm preaching for you today. Amen? Amen. And I, I could say boldly today, there is no husband that asked me to preach on this subject today. All right? So all the wives, in case you are saying, uh, he must have talked to the pastor today. I, nope. All right. So the first thing you could do for your dad or your husband is love, and, and, and by the way, some of the stuff we're going to talk about, you could, you could give to your wife, you could share with your sister or your daughter, but you know, it's Father's Day today, so it's our day. All right, it's good. I was telling somebody today, it's like every holiday is something for my wife now, like even Canada Day is going to be her birthday, you know, like I'm exaggerating, but the Father's Day do not touch. It's Father's Day, man. Come on, fathers, are you with me? It's our day. It's our day, all day. Until midnight. It's our day. Remember that. It's the only day of the year we have. <laughs> All right. Here's a couple of things you could do for your dad and your husband. Love him unconditionally. Listen to John chapter 4, verse 11. Dear friends, since God so loved us, everybody say so loved us, so loved us. we also ought to love one another. Now, how did God so love us? He loved us unconditionally. See, God did not love you when you were sanctified. God did not love you when you were perfect. In fact, you're still not perfect, in case you thought you were. God did not love you when you prayed four hours a day or when you preached or when you went to church every Sunday of that year. God loved you in your mess. God loved me in my mess. In fact, God would take a, a, a selfie today of you, or a Yui, I don't know if you, you not a selfie, but a Yui, a, a photo of you, don't even know if that's a word. We're making stuff up. But if he took a screen, a, a, a photo of you right now, he would love that version of you. He would love you now, even if you didn't change a thing. He would. Okay, there may be stuff about you that he doesn't love, like sin. He doesn't love sin. You all know how it goes. God loves this, the sinner. He doesn't love the sin and, and, and vice versa. But if, if he took a screenshot of you right now, he would love you the way you are. But he loves you so much that he'll continue to change you, right? From glory to glory, more like Jesus. But that's how he loved us. He loved us with no strings attached, with no condition. He didn't say, if you pray four hours a day, I'm going to love you. If, if, if you're a good Christian, I'm going to love you. He didn't say that. He loves us unconditionally, no strings attached. And that's what motivates us to be everything he wants us to be. It's, you know, it's, it's not all these things we have to do. It's the motivation is love. Would you say amen to that? And he loved us even in our mess. Even if we look at ourselves like, how can God love me in that time, in that period of my life? I don't even love myself in that period of my life. How can God love me? That's the kind of love God calls us to give to others. And that's the kind of love I'm talking about today, to give to your dad, to give to your husband. Show them that you love them with no strings attached. What, what, does, what does love mean? There's many Greek words for different types of love, but love in general is, is more a choice. We've talked about this so many times. Love is not a feeling. It's not an emotion. It's more like a choice. It's more like a commitment. 
Sometimes there is feelings. Hopefully there is feelings. But it's not just about feelings. It's more about commitment and choice because sometimes you have feelings, but they're not loving feelings. They're, uh, it was Billy Graham's wife, they asked her, they said, have you ever thought of divorcing Billy? This is when he was al alive. And he says, I never thought about divorcing Billy Graham, but I did think about killing him a couple of times. <laughs> And so sometimes you have feelings, but it's all about the commitment. It's the choice. It's, it's the determination that I'm going to stick it true. I'm going to have long suffering. I'm going to have patience. I'm going to stick it true, true to good and the bad, true to beauty and the ugly, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Right? It doesn't mean we tolerate bad behavior and we allow abusive relations, but we're talking about sticking it true. That's what love is. It's a choice to love your dad. It's a choice to love your husband with no strings attached. With no if. If you change. If you become a doctor with a six-figure salary. If you become more like him or, or him or the guy on the TV. This is important because when you show your husband or your dad or your male figure in your life that you love him unconditionally, this shows him that you accept him for who he is. I've seen husbands suffer internally because they felt that they could not measure up. They're not good enough. They're not rich enough. They're not slim enough. They're not tall enough. They're not spiritual enough. They're not godly enough. They're not handyman enough. They're not techie enough. They're not like him enough or him enough. And then all of that, trying but never being able to achieve, it silently kills a man inside of him. He doesn't feel love unconditionally. He always feels he needs to produce in order to earn that affection and that love. But if you show him that no matter what, if he got a nice job or he lost this job, that you are in his corner, that you support him, Woohoo! That will do something to a man. And he could take on the whole world because he knows he's got his family in his corner, no matter what happens. You're removing that extra pressure on him. He's already got pressure on him, but you're removing the extra pressure of maybe losing his family or maybe losing respect in the eyes of his family. I mean, think about it. If your dad's a doctor... And I don't know, he gets midlife crisis at 40-something years old. And he says, I don't want to be a doctor anymore. I want to be a mechanic. What are you going to do? Is he going to love him? If you love the doctor more than your father, that's not going to happen. But if you love the father more than the doctor, you will love him no matter what he is, even if he's collecting garbages. What happens if he loses his license? Whatever, what happens if he's paralyzed and he can't do what he's good at doing? If you love what he does rather than loving who he is, that's going to happen. We need to love him for who he is rather than what he does. And he may do something spectacularly well, but love the father, love the dad, love the husband, love the son. Don't love what your son does. He's good at this, he's good at that. Love him. And show him that you love him before you love what he does. Because he may fail in what he does. He may change interests in what he does. But you love him. Amen? And I guarantee you that man will be able to do anything for his family. He's, he's going to be willing to do anything for his family. If he knows, he's got you in this corner cheering him on, supporting, praying for him, saying, I got this. I, I, you got this. I'm behind you. I'm praying for you. Love the person more than the performance. All right, second thing. Like I said, this is all, this is not rock and science. However, if we've applied that in our couples and our marriages and our home, my goodness, we would have good results, wouldn't we? Second thing is accept him for who he is, not who you want him to become. Let me say that again. Accept him for who he is, not who you want him to become. 
you know, I don't know about you if you're seeing this or not, but culture seems to be hinting that there's a mistake, there's a problem with man. Oh, I agree there's a problem with man. It's called sin. But culture seems to say there's a, there's a, a bug with man. Even the feminist movement strong on this. It seems like they want to convert men to be more feminine. And the problem of men is that he's not feminine enough. It's true, right? I'm exaggerating in a sense. I agree with the value. I think everybody is equal. I think everybody's important. We have different roles, but we're equal in the eyes of God. But don't try to make me a woman. Because God made me a man. Right? And the wise women of this church know that when God created men and your sons and your husbands and your fathers, he did not make a mistake. They are who they are. They're wired the way they're wired because God intended them to be that way. He didn't make a mistake. It's not a bug to be fixed. And we need to accept the men in our lives, speaking to ladies right now, that they are different, they think different, they process things this differently, they see things differently. Did you know that we could say the same thing and mean two different things? Oh, I learned this really early in our marriage, 12 years ago, 13 years ago, 12. <laughs> Somewhere around there, <laughs> I think it's 12. Hey, by the way, I could watch the same movie twice. And by the end of the movie, I say, I think I saw this movie. <laughs> right, it's true, true story. <laughs> We're still watching 1990 movies, right? They're like it's the first time. Anyways, I learned this real early in our marriage. I remember we opened, uh, she opened the, uh, Gadans opened the fridge, and there was no more milk in the fridge. And uh, she says, oh, honey. There's no milk in the fridge. And I opened the fridge too and I said, you're right. There's no milk in the fridge. And I closed the, the fridge thinking, you know, let's go on with our day. We were both saying the same thing, but she was saying it more like, honey, would you be kind enough to go to the store and get some milk? <laughs> I was more like observation. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> so I realized we're not saying the same thing. Our, our, our expressions are different. So she'll, she'll look at the bank account. Again, when we started, we got married, she would say, man, we have no money in the bank account. And I look at the bank account. What do you mean? We have $500 in the bank account. <laughs> we still have money. We're good. We're good for a week. It's like we have no money. in. The, see, so we communicated. We say the same thing, but we mean different things. And... Um, and, and so that could bring some challenges. You've got to understand the difference between your father. Maybe he says something, and you've got to kind of decrypt, decode. Uh, somebody wrote a book. It was called Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus. Uh, you know, and uh, I don't think that was a Christian, but the Christian edition is called Men Are Waffles and Women Are Spaghetti. And it was talking about how men love their box. You know, the little compartments and... That's work, that's family, that's, you know, hobby, that's whatever. And they like to go from one box to another. But here's the thing. They could close those boxes and move on like it was nothing. As a woman, she's more like a spaghetti. Everything's interconnected. <laughs> so she had a bad day at 9 o'clock in the morning and it's 8 o'clock. It's still connected with everything that happened during the day. The man is able to shut that door and we're done. Oh, that's a long time ago. Are you guys are going to have a conversation and you're like, okay, conversation number one, conversation number two, conversation number three, but she'll bring back conversation number one like it's all the same conversation. <laughs> it's like we're still talking about that. So we're different. And you need to accept that. That's how we're designed. We have different ways to think. We have different needs. Men's needs and women's needs are not the same. And I think that's the beauty of love right now is because it forces us to step out of our needs to offer the needs of the other. Some of the needs women have, men don't have. And if a man's going to fulfill the needs of his wife, he needs to step out of his own comfort zone. And the same thing with a woman. Did you know that sex, you knew I was going to talk about that, 
is number one, number two need for men. Not number one. People think it's the number one. It's all that men think about. It's actually number two. And many Christian service, sex is number two need for men. Do you know where it lands in women's needs? Number 13. <laughs> so you're like, why? <laughs> why couldn't it be number two? And so there's some things even that women have as need that men don't like doing, don't like. They're not, it's not natural for them to do, but it forces them to step out of their comfort zone. And that's the beauty of love. That's what love is. Love is not a feeling. Love is a decision. It's, it's a commitment. It's a choice. Amen? We need to accept the man God put in our life for who they are, how they're wired, not how we want to change them or make them. Oh, and this one is good. Don't compare him to someone else. Oh, that's huge. I see it all the time. We do it. We compare things. Oh, my goodness. Too close? Pull it back? What are these? These will just <laughs> grab another mic. <laughs> you see a man excelling in his business, and you look at your husband, and you're saying, why can't you be more like him? That's a bad thing to do. You see a man, you know, he's doing this for his family. He's doing this for the house. He's gifted in this area. And you start talking to your husband about that. Something inside is going to die. He may not say it, but he's going to feel it. If you're always hinting that he, you want him to become more like the next door neighbor, it's gonna, something's going to happen in his heart. And let me remind you that not only are you destroying the man that is in front of you, but you're actually sinning before God. Did you know that? If I compare my wife with somebody else, I'm actually not only destroying something inside of her, I'm actually I'm sinning against God. Listen, may I remind you what is the 10th Amendment? You, you don't remember? Okay, so Exodus 20. Verse, you thought, you know, in New Testament, we don't need to remember the 10 Commandments? Is that what you thought? <laughs> All right, that's a discussion for another day. Exod Exodus 20, verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant or his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. In other words, do not desire. Covet really means strong desire. Do not desire what is your neighbor. Do not desire anything in your neighbor's house. Do not desire anything in your neighbor's house. In other words, be content with what you have. And do not look at the grass, the next door neighbor's grass, and think it's greener than yours. In my case, it is, actually. They, they really all, they invest in so much fertilizer that it's, it's uh, very green. Learn to be content with what you have. Be content with your father. Be content with your husband, with, the, with who your sons are and what they've become. And again, I'm not saying you accept everything they do that is wrong, that is sin, that is maybe a, something they're doing that's heart, heartbroken, but you accept the man, who he is. And let him know you admire something in him. Find something that you admire in him. Let him know. We're so quick at letting people know. I know I do this with my sons all the time. I let them know their mistakes. I let them know what they did wrong. But let them know what you admire about them. Because if all we do is let them know and let them feel how bad they are or what, they're not good enough, they're gonna, it's going to lead to discouragement. All right, number three. Love him unconditionally. Accept him for who he is, not who you want him to become or who you think he should become. And number three, and if you forget everything I said, do not forget number three. Because number three is the big one. Number three is the number one need. In most Christian service, it's the number one need that most men will say, yeah, that's my number one. If, if you ask me, you know, unconditional love, acceptance for who I am, and uh, number three, if he asked me to pick one, well, I could, live a, I could live without unconditional love. I could live without that acceptance. 
but I can't live without number three. Number three is huge. And what is number three? Number three is respect and honor. They both don't mean the same thing, but kind of in the sense. But this is the biggest one. Men will sacrifice love and acceptance for this one. Women, it's the other way around. We all need respect. We all need honor. We all need love. But women, for them, and say amen if you believe that, women, please help me. Don't leave me <laughs> by myself here. I know I preach for men today, but don't leave me to dry. For women, they want love. They want love. They want, they want affection. Okay, few from. Okay. <laughs> they want love. And they, they, they want respect too, but they want love. Men, they want respect, then they want love. Amen, guys? Guys, am I? Yeah, okay. Just making sure, you know, I did my homework properly. Now listen to Ephesians chapter 4. 5 verse 33 and there's so many verses on this this one seems to say it well it says let each one of you love his wife as himself again we see love love your wives some versions say or some texts say love your wife as Christ loved the church but then he says to their ladies he says and let the wife see that she respects her husband notice he doesn't say see that she loves her husband there's other verses that talk about loving your husband, but here it says, let the wife see that she respects her husband. So husband, love your wife. Wives, respect your husband. I, I, um, I fell on a resource that you, some of you may have heard. We actually did a, a course on it called Love and Respect by, I believe, Dr. Emerson that talks about this crazy cycle that we find ourselves in a marriage, and it's often... It's often because the man doesn't have respect and the woman doesn't have love. And I love that resource. If you're having marriage problems, we're going to talk about things you could do there. We all, I don't know one marriage that was, you don't they hit a home run right off the bat. We all need help in that from time to time. But um, I've read so many resources on marriage counseling and books on marriage. I, I'll say this is the number one. This is the number one resource, and here's why I say it's the number one resource. And I'm speaking very biased as a man. you got to understand that. A lot of resources would say we need to love each other. And it was love, 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 and that's great. We need love. Love is important. But I felt like love was just meeting the woman's needs. And the man was, men's needs were not covered because this book talks about respect for men is the equivalence of love for women. Amen? It's true. A man will do anything for respect and honor. Not only in the relationship of marriage, but also as a parent. Listen to what he says. The writer says, or Paul says to children, in Ephesians 6, verse 1, he says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Watch what he said. Honor, this is actually a commandment. We're looking at commandments today. Honor your father and mother which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy a long life. He's commanding children to honor their mom and dad. And he says, if you're going to honor your parents, it's going to go well with you. It's not only you're going to enjoy a long life, it's going to go well with you. In other words, there are blessings if you put this into practice. God says it will go well with you if you honor your parents. You say, well, my parents are not honorable. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. I truly believe that the level of honor and respect that you give a husband or a dad or a person in a home will also determine the level of miracle if he's a believer that this person will be involved in, or the level of, a measure of capacity that he will work in and, 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 and excel in. You don't believe me? This actually happened for Jesus as well. Mark 6. Jesus left there and went to his hometown accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, 
He began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things? They asked. What, what's this wisdom he has been given? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't he just the, the carpenter? Isn't he Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, and Judah, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. They took offense at him. In other words, you shouldn't be doing that kind of stuff because we know you, we know your sisters. You're, you're from the same community, same street. We used to play ball together when we were young. They took offense at him. Verse 4, Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor. In other words, a prophet, it's, it's an honor to be a prophet. He says, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his home. In other words, in your hometown there will be a familiarity. People are not expecting miracles to happen from you, if, from your brother. James, I'm sure James wasn't thinking Jesus would do all these signs and wonders because he's my brother, right? And, and so there's a familiarity that's there. He could, and, and verse 5, watch what he says. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. This lack of faith happened because of the familiarity that was there the low expectation they had of Jesus because they were familiar with him. And if you show your dad, and I'm not talking about reverence to your dad, I'm not talking about that, I'm just talking about honor. I'm just talking about admiring your dad. I'm just talking about saying you, you believe great things that could happen through your dad or through your husband. It's this atmosphere of, of honor that seems to activate the miracle. But this atmosphere of dishonor seems to um, restrain or reduce the capacity of miracles. Quickly, my time is running out. I want to answer three questions about this. How do we show honor? What do you do if you're the man, but you don't receive this respect and honor? And number three, what do you do if you're the woman or you're the son or the daughter and your dad or your husband is not an honorable man? What do you do in those situations? All right, so how do we show honor quickly? You honor him publicly, right? So that means you talk positive about him to others. It's true. I, I hear a lot of people talking about their husbands, but it's not positive. Of course we know your husband's not perfect. We know he's got some issues he's working on or he needs to work on. We know that. We don't assume that your husband is perfect. But I'm sure he's not asking you to come and air his dirty laundry publicly all the time. If you have a few moments with a person to talk, why, why not use those times to be edifying instead of dishonoring your husband? I mean, that's what the Bible commends us to do, right? Ephesians 4.29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as it's good for building up, as it fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. I've seen women who struggle in their marriage, and yet I would not get anything dishonorable in what they said. And I knew the husband was a hard guy to get along with. And they would still honor that man. Another way you could honor your dad or your husband is listen to him. You know, again, women are different than men. Men, women, listen to me. Especially if you didn't grow up with brothers or when you guys talk, women, you're able to talk on top of each other and still understand each other. I remember my wife did a retreat for the ladies of this church, and she said, wow, we went to bed really late last night. I'm like, what do you mean? Yeah, we were talking. But the way they talk is they're talking together, and they understand each other. Guys, it's different. Guys, you talk, I listen. When you're done, I talk. 
And if you interrupt me, it's interrupt. You're interrupting me. So it's it's different. So when you think I'm your girlfriend, and you interrupt, you're interrupting me. I'm going to stop talking, and I'm going to forget what I was saying, <laughs> and I'm not going to continue the conversation because you're going to interrupt me again. We're going to talk about something else. And you wonder why your husband's not talking. <laughs> if he talks, you interrupt. <laughs> Listen to him. Listen to him right to the end. <laughs> Wait till he's finished. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> it's just, we're different. We're not better, we're different. The way we're wired. And sometimes it's not just, you know, finish till it's finished, but let's try to listen what he's trying to say instead of filling the blanks for him. Try listen to his frustrations. Listen to his fears. Listen to his dream. Even though you don't agree with it. Even though you're scared and you're wondering how much that's gonna cost. Listen to his dream. I know some of you, when he's sharing his dream, you're pulling out the calculator and you got the bank account open and you're like, uh -uh. <laughs> Listen, he may never do it, but man, he feels good because you heard him. Amen. And pray like crazy, it never happens unless it's from the Lord. Because <laughs> he's going to cost a lot, right? Or vice versa, but listen to him. Another way is value his opinion. Value his opinion. It doesn't mean that's the only opinion you listen to, but you value it. So many times you, you, you find a lady, she's valuing doctor so-and-so, pastor so-and-so, rev so-and-so, brother so-and-so, but never values the opinion of her own husband at home. How do you think he's going to feel? At least show that you consider what he says, his ideas and his opinions. If he says something to the kids, don't wait till he leaves to say the opposite to the kids. Remind the kids what the dad said. That's a way to show that you honor your, what your husband says and your father. Amen? Ask for his opinion. I know I ask my wife a lot of things, her opinion on things, you know, like how to dress and is it okay? And sometimes I feel like I need my wife more than she needs me. But I feel good when she asks for my opinion. <laughs> you, you ask me? Oh, this is good. Don't treat him like a kid. My goodness, I was talking with a lady, she's maybe 60 or 70, maybe closer to her 70s and we're talking, great chat, talking about dogs, talking about this and that, gardening and stuff. And then her husband comes in the conversation. I was like, oh, great. Get to know th this man. And I think five times in the conversation, she corrected her husband. I felt awkward. She was treating him like a kid. So if you're doing that publicly, imagine at home. And she may not even know what she's doing. She may not. Do it like that. But I'm sure inside of him, there's something dying. Don't treat him like a kid. He may be a kid, though. I'm not saying. I think we're all kids, right? <laughs> Come on, guys. Am I, am I, is this good? Right all right. Man. That's good. Good stuff. <laughs> all right. Pray for him. There's no better way to honor him than to say, I'm praying for you. What else do you want me to pray for you? Is there anything specific you want me to pray for you? Anything you're struggling with that you want me to pray for you? Anything that you have that you're thinking about you want me to pray for? I like this one. Do something he likes, not necessarily something you like. Because if you only do to your husband or give to your husband or share with your husband what you like all the time, you know who you're honoring? You're honoring you. Not him. If you honor him by giving him something that you don't really like, but he likes and he enjoys, 
It could be, you know, letting him his day off with his friends, go and watch football or go play on the quads or do something at golf. Whatever it is, I don't know what it is. Every man's different, but boat, fishing, whatever. You're honoring him because you know he likes that. Amen? All right. Uh, what do you do if you're the man? And maybe you're a woman and that's vice versa for you. But wh what do you do if you're the man and that respect is absent? You're maybe with someone who doesn't value marriage or doesn't value the word of God doesn't really value family like you value it. You're saying, this is all nice. I love what you spoke, but my wife doesn't want, or my husband doesn't want, if you're a wife, and i got to say that these days, but um, if, if your, your person that you're married to doesn't see eye to eye on this marriage thing, you're saying, what do I do in that situation? Three things. Tell Jesus about it. Jesus, I'm sure there's things that I need to change in my own life, so I ask you to change my life. But if I'm truly innocent in this situation, and you see that this person is pur purposely withdrawing my needs that only her or him could give me, I pray you deal with that person. Because I can't do it. And if I try to fix it, it's going to make things difficult. So you deal with her. Tell Jesus about it. And if she's a, a praying lady, guess what? Jesus is going to talk to her. Because he's a specialist in fixing marriages and family. He is. He, he is. He, he's per per perfect at restoration, at healing and fixing. Family was his idea. Marriage was his idea. He said it's not good for men to be alone, therefore it's good. He said, Jesus, this is not good here. Would you make it good? And he's going to help you in that. Tell Jesus about it. Secondly, tell somebody about it. When I say somebody, I'm not just saying anybody. I'm just people of confidence, people of maturity. You know, we do have counselors that you could talk to, Christian counselors. There's Dr. Michael Hart in Orleans, who has uh, Elam Ministries on CHRI. He's he does this for a living. He helps families. He helps people with those tough situations. We've got Pastor Daniel DeCarri that we had here a couple of times in Montreal. He's willing to do a Zoom. You've got pastoral guidance here at this church as well. Pastoral spiritual counsel as well that's there. Talk to somebody about those things. You say, well, the counselor costs money. The pastor is free. <laughs> True. It's true. It's actually true. Most of us, we have insurance. But is a couple bucks, is your marriage worth a couple bucks? Is it valuable enough for you to fork out a few dollars if you have to pay out of pocket? So tell Jesus about it. Tell someone about it. And, and, and this is good. This is going to be for you men. If you're in a situation where you're not getting your needs met, you're not getting that respect that you should be getting from your family, understand how God sees you. I love what Megan prayed in, our off, in my office right before we came. She, she said, Lord, I pray that we would find our affection in you. And, and you may be in a situation where you think you should get that from your family, your wife, your kids. Your kids are not listening to you. Your, your wife is not showing you respect that you think you should, you should get. In those moments, it's vital for you to, to remember that you get everything you need in Christ. I've learned a long time ago that if I build my self-esteem on people's compliments, they will also destroy my self-esteem when they do critics. We've got to make sure that we rely on the Lord for that kind of stuff. Again, you should be getting it, but if you're not getting it, you find comfort in the Lord. While you're waiting for your miracle, He's there helping you. All right, I, I could talk more about that. My time's running out, and you do want to eat that rib, right? And uh, All right, what do you do when you're the wife 
and you're you're hearing the pastor talk about honoring your husband or you're the child and you're like you don't know my dad if you knew my dad you wouldn't preach a message like that you're like how can i honor a dishonorable man well here's why because i believe that you and i can make a person honorable by honoring them Okay, I know there's some exceptions, and I know there's some people who are just hard and they won't change. I get that. I get that. I'm going to show you an example of somebody who was like that in the Bible. But I, I believe that you and I could help a person become an honorable person by honoring them. Not because they deserve the honor, but when you honor them, it makes them honorable. It really does. Proverbs 31, 30, 23 says, it talks about the accent, or, or, or yeah, the accent is on the woman. It's on the proverb 33, 31 woman. And she, it says her husband is known in the gates uh, when he sits among the elders of the land. He's a very honorable man. And the question is, did he become honorable before they got married? Or was he honorable because of the marriage? Because of his wife? Because the accent, again, in Proverbs 31 seems to be on the woman. And it describes her husband. So many believe that it's her influence that made him, that transformed him into an honorable man. I'm telling you, wife, if you honor your husband, even if in your heart you don't think he deserves the honor, it's going to do a lot of growth in his life, a lot of change in his life. And I'm, I'm not saying use that as some kind of manipulation or whatever learn to honor your husband and i'm i'm sure he's going to love you in ways you never saw him do because that's his number one need show him your honor him first peter 3 1 says in the same way wives must accept the authority of of your husband then if watch this 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 is for the wife who's with an unbeliever this is for the woman who is with someone who doesn't obey the gospel. Peter says to them, to all of you who are in that situation, wives, you must accept the authority, the leadership of your husband. Doesn't mean you don't contribute to it. Doesn't mean that you don't speak. It just means that God has designed it this way that husbands are kind of the head of the house. Somebody said, I watched a movie back in the days that says, you know, that the husband and the wife were arguing, and the, the, wife, uh, the husband said to the wife, you know what, though? The Bible says that men are the head of the wife, or head of the house. And the wife says, you're right. Husband is the head of the house. But the woman is the neck that makes the head turn. But the Bible calls, in this context, if you're in, in a situation where your husband is a non dishonorable man, he says, he says this, if they refuse to obey the good news, your godly lives will speak to them without any words. They will be won over. In other words, you could win an unbelieving husband just because you honor him. That is powerful. Here we are working super hard to make these sermons about salvation and here you can win a man by honoring him that's how powerful honor is that's how important honor is for a man you remember Ab abigail in the bible you can read about it in first samuel 25 the bible describes abigail as intelligent or discerning beautiful but her husband was nabel and he's described as a man who was harsh, who was badly behaved, no honor. And there was a moment where David, King David, showed up and he asked a favor for Nabal. He's, he, he, he had showed mercy and favor to uh, Nabal's household in the past. And now he was coming on his property and he was asking for help. And Nabal said, who are you? Why should I help you? And he was very dishonorable to David. David got offended. David was mad. In fact, pulling out the sword. They were going to go at it. What does Abigail does? 
Abigail heard about it. She ran. She brought so much food, some donkeys, and she came and appeased David. She fixed the situation, but she was stuck with a dishonorable man. That Her whole family would have died if, if she was going to continue with his leadership. But she did the honorable thing in the time. She stood for her family. You know what happened with this situation? And I, I, I'm going to share what the lesson is here. This man, 10 days after, he actually died. This dishonorable man actually died 10 days. And the Bible says the Lord struck them. And you know what? <laughs> David ended up marrying her. You know what this is saying here? Okay, I'm not saying that your husband's going to die and the Lord's going to struck him. <laughs> Some of you are like, hmm, now that'd be good. You know? I'm not saying that. <laughs> but it's saying God will deal with the situation. If you're stuck in a situation where you're honoring a dishonorable person, God will reward your honor. Because you're not honoring the man. You're honoring the principle of God. Therefore, you're honoring God when you're honoring your parents. Because God says, honor your parents. Even if they're dishonorable, you're honoring your parents because you want to honor God. You're honoring your husband even if he's a dishonorable. Man, I'm not excusing the behavior. I'm not saying empower his behavior. I'm just saying show him respect and honor that he needs. And God will honor you. In this case, he struck the guy. He was not changeable. Remove the guy, give him a better husband. All right? That's not the message I'm communicating here. But I'm saying God's got you. God will take notice. Would you say amen to that? Oh, this is a, this is a three way. Okay, let's stand. Somebody said men are like dogs. Praise them from time to time and give them a little treat and you could train them. <laughs> Amen? Okay, no, no, that's not. All right. We're not dogs, right? We're not. We're created men. Can we stand? Worship team, would you mind? I want to take a moment. I want to pray for men. We value the role fathers has in our lives. We want to pray for you men, for fathers. I want to pray for all the men in our church. Would you mind, if you're a father, just lift up your hands today. The rest of us, would you just stretch out your hands towards the dad that you see here in this place? And if you're at home and your dad is there, just lay hands on him right now. I want to pray for all the dads, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of dads, the gift of fathers. We thank you for putting them in our lives. We thank you for how they contribute to our lives or have contributed in some way or some shape or form. Today we honor our family. We honor our dads, Lord. We thank you for them. We ask your blessing on them. We ask that you shower them of your love, of your wisdom, of your strength, of your grace, of your mercy. Pray that you cover our dads, you cover our husbands, you cover our brothers, our sons. Would you protect them? Would you walk before them? Would you guide them? Would you reveal yourself to them even deeper? Would they become closer to the fathers that you want them to be? Would they become more everything that you call them to be? All the men of, the men of God you call them to be. Today we, we, we support them. Today we're in their corner. And, and we say, Lord, be with our fathers, be with our husband, be with our sons, be with our brothers. Let the man in this church be strong. Let the men in this church be on, on fire for God. Let the men in this church be successful in what you call them to, to put their time to. Let the men in this church be faithful. Let the men in this church, Lord, have their eyes on Jesus through every season. 
But Lord, let the men in this church not die inside, but have life in abundance. Hallelujah. Thank you for blessing the man in our church, God. Thank you, Lord, for men that are contagious, men that are speaking volumes to this community, to, to this society, Lord, who are desperately seeking for a father figure in their lives. I pray that they will find that in the people of this church so that they could point him to the perfect father, the heavenly father. Minister to every man in this church. Pray you bless them. Pray you provide for them. Pray you strengthen them. But you pray that you minister to them. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing one song before we leave. Happy Father's Day, guys. Find your dad. Find a role model in your life, maybe if you don't have a dad, and spend some time to just honor them today. And again, happy Father's Day. God bless you guys.